Well, hello everybody and um, welcome to the talk this morning. Um, so, um, yeah, well, to introduce my talk, I'm, I'm doing this as a volunteer for Cheshire Wildlife Trust. And um, I was looking for something to do in my retirement. So a bit like a busman's holiday, I wanted to do something just similar to what I've been doing because uh, I was a biology lecturer at the University of Chester. So, um, and I wanted to do something for conservation. So I asked them for a project and they said that they knew very little about reptiles in Cheshire. Uh, so uh, I knew it was going to be quite a challenge. Uh, more on that later. Uh, but um, yeah, it's really interesting and I'm really enjoying it. They're fascinating animals. Okay, I can't see the screen. I can only see the slide, so I can't see Sue. So, Sue, do you want me to okay, just go yes. ahead now? Yeah, I've got your slides up on screen. Yep. You're doing the corner small. Away you go. You, oh, right. Okay, right, right. Okay, right. So, I will start. So, that's me in the photograph holding a slow worm, which was unfortunately in Shropshire, not in Cheshire. Um, but uh, I was delighted to uh, find that, or rather, somebody else found it for me. So, uh, so I thought I'd start off just by talking about um, a little bit about what reptiles are because um, many people are a bit confused about the difference between reptiles and amphibians. So I'll just give you um, a clue here. There are three reptiles and three amphibians there. So that will uh, maybe give you a bit of a start. But if I go through them, so top left, we've got um, a slow worm which is a reptile, but the other two at the top there are both amphibians. So we've got a frog um, and a tadpole. And um, the, there's a massive difference between amphibians and reptiles in evolutionary terms, because um, amphibians are very much uh, uh, stuck with living near water. They have damp skin and they mostly reproduce by laying their eggs in water whereas reptiles have made a huge evolutionary leap uh, and they are able to live in very dry places, so like deserts, and uh, they, are, uh, they don't have damp skin. So at the bottom, we've got two more reptiles. We've got a common lizard and a grass snake. And in the middle is a great crested newt. And it looks, at first glance, very like the lizard. But in fact, they're very different because of its, um, its damp skin. And they are not fast movers, um, amphibians. And, uh, you know, if you think of the frogs hopping along, newts drag themselves along, whereas lizards can really run um, fast. OK, so, uh, so this is a slide about types of reptiles. Um, and you can see that um, many of them look fairly similar. So we've got the skink at the top there. Um, and a lizard and a gecko and the, uh, and the chameleon. And they are all in fact quite closely related. And they're also quite closely related to the snake. So snakes evolved from a lizard-like animal that um, lost its uh, legs. Uh, and the other three here are, are not closely related to these um, other reptiles. So crocodiles are one group and turtles and tortoises, obviously, they're closely related to each other. But um, interestingly, the um, snakes and lizards group is more closely related to birds than it is to the crocodiles and turtles and tortoises. So uh, they, um, and of course, the snakes and lizards group are the only ones that we have in this country. So it's quite a diverse group, sort of stuck together um, in evolutionary terms. Okay, so what is a reptile? How do we define it? So uh, first, they were the first vertebrates to live on land, and they are mostly predators. So there are some um, that, um, about like, uh, term tortoises that um, eat uh, that are herbivores but um, most of them are uh, pretty fast and um, are voracious predators uh, and the massive advance for them from amphibians is they evolved this waterproof scaly skin which you can see in the picture here so this is a grass snake sloughing off its skin so um, you can see the scales from underneath and you can even see the eye scale. So that has to be shed as well. 
um, when they shed their skin. So that, that's up there. Um, and this means that they are very well protected um, from uh, drying out. That's the most important thing, but also from damage and ultraviolet light and infections and so on. So they have um, um, a big advantage over amphibians. The disadvantage is that they have to shed their skin to grow, which you can see there. Um, and they breathe with their lungs only, which you might think um, is quite a, uh, an obvious thing, but um, amphibians don't. They use their skin, so it's damp, um, part of the reason for gas exchange, um, for respiratory uh, uh, gas exchange. And um, they uh, have a very different mechanism of breathing. Uh, whereas reptiles have large lungs and um, they can use those. And it, that's the reason why they can have dry skin. And I'm sure everybody knows reptiles are cold blooded. Um, and this means that they need to warm up to be active and they can't live in cold places. So there's lots of reptiles, snakes and things and in hot places, but not in cold places. Okay, so just going on to a little bit about reproduction. So uh, reptiles either uh, produce waterproof eggs or they um, give birth to live young. And on the right there, you can see a snake just hatching out of um, an egg. And their eggs are leathery rather than like a hen's egg, which is brittle. So and you can see that there, so that's a soft egg. So that again is very different to the amphibians. So there's no aquatic larval stage. Um, and the young are um, active and can fend for themselves straight away. Although adults do often uh, protect them. So, so going on to um, why I'm doing the survey. So, um, well, as I was saying at the beginning, it was um, um, Cheshire Wildlife Trust uh, felt that they had very little information about reptiles in the county. Um, and conservation in this country has become a very crucial um, thing. We're, we're at a tipping point, really, um, for climate change as well and biodiversity. Um, and Britain in particular is one of the most nature depleted countries in the world, uh, which is very sad. Uh, there was a recent state of nature report that found that a quarter of mammals and half of the birds that they assessed were in danger of extinction. So this is a massive decline in our wildlife. And this was assessed since the 1970s. Um, so our uh, wildlife is being lost at, at, at a great rate um, and I will send Sue the slides and I'll put a link at the bottom to the um, State of Nature reports so if anybody's interested they can read it. Okay so why is this? Why is there such a, a huge decline? Well the main reason is a loss of habitats so our wild habitats are um, small, uh, fragmented. So in other words, they don't have links between them and they're degraded. So we have lovely wild places, but they tend to be um, very well used by people and dogs and, and so on. Um, uh, and of course, as well, we have the effect of climate change and um, pollution. Uh, and the intensification of farming has a massive effect on wildlife as well. So farmers, uh, farming is very efficient in this country, but it doesn't leave much room for uh, wildlife, unless, I mean, lots of farmers do make, uh, provide especially for wildlife. So why survey? So surveying allows you to find where the wildlife is and then um, it can be uh, protected. <clears throat> okay, so uh, going on to reptiles in Cheshire, so what species do we have? We have, uh, in fact, we've only got four species. So it did make identification uh, very nice and simple for me. Um, apart from telling males from females, which is a bit more complicated. Um, but the four species that we have 
are common lizards, slow worms, grass snakes and adders. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about each of these species. Uh, and they are all found in heathland, um, woodland and grassland, although grass snakes um, are um, good swimmers uh, and they require water as well. And reptiles are very rarely seen and little is known about their uh, distribution uh, in the country generally and certainly in Cheshire. <clears throat> All of them hibernate, so um, the survey can only take place from March to October, so quite a long hibernation um, of time. Um, and um, the reason um, in Cheshire why they're doing so badly is that um, it's a very built up county um, and plus um, it's very agricultural. And I've just got this map to show you so that you can um, just to illustrate that point. So uh, and this is obviously just part of Cheshire and over on the right hand side of the screen, you can see Winsford. Um, but um, and Chester is over uh, would be off the screen on the left. So there are large built up areas um, and then the rest of it is mostly agricultural. So the white is agricultural land. And then we have very small areas which are suitable for um, wildlife such as reptiles. So we've got Delamere Forest, although, of course, that's a lot of that's coniferous plantation. So it's not that suitable. Um, and we've got Little Budworth Common here, which is great. Actually, I'm um, doing survey work uh, there. Um, and we've got the Sandstone Ridge and uh, part of the Peak District is in Cheshire as well. So, um, so there are small areas, but it just illustrates um, how um, separated they are. Um, and also they have other uses. So like forestry and also um, um, just for people as well, uh, places to, uh, wild places to go. Okay, so I'm going to talk now a little bit about the four species and tell you a little bit about them. Um, and starting off with the common lizards. So um, you can see that picture there. Um, and hopefully you can clearly see the scales. So if you're not sure whether it's a newt or a reptile, look closely and you should see the scales there. And um, they have more neck bones um, reptiles than amphibians. And you can see this lizard here holding its head up. So it's um, able to um, uh, turn its head around much more than um, a uh, newt can. So all about lizards are most common and widespread reptile, 10 to 15 centimetres long, so uh, not very big, quite long lived, so five to six years, a small animal. And they eat invertebrates, so insects and spiders, and, and they're quite fast and they um, um, can catch them with their tongue. They breed in July and they uh, produce um, um, live young, about three to 11 um, uh, live babies, small and dark they are when they're first, um, uh, when they're juveniles. And they have this very um, interesting adaptation where they uh, shed their tail to escape, um, which is, um, and it looks awful because um, it looks like uh, you must have damaged them. And I have to say, I only did this once when I was a child in the Mediterranean, um, and lizards were absolutely everywhere on holiday, <clears throat> and I didn't know. Um, so lizards should be handled with great care and never caught by the tail. And they have a sort of weak spot at the top of this tail and they can drop it and um, they don't bleed or anything. But the tail carries on moving, which is an, an amazing adaptation because it means that predators are going to go for the tail while the animal runs off. And then they regrow their tail with a stick of cartilage rather than um, vertebral, vertebrae. And they, they're doing quite well in Cheshire, actually. Um, they seem to be quite widespread. So um, I've had reports of them in Delamere Forest. Very nice chap working at Go8 told me he saw them regularly. Um, I've been surveying at Bickerton Hill and I've seen them there. Uh, and they seem to be doing well there. Uh, up on the Wirral, they seem to be doing well. 
And somebody recently sent me a photograph of one in her back garden in Chester. So, um, so they seem to be reasonably widespread. <laughs> okay, so moving on to our second most common reptile in um, Cheshire, we've got the grass snakes. And again, you can really see the um, scales on um, the grass snake, recognized by the collar behind the head. So it's a sort of brownish green snake with a uh, creamy uh, collar uh, with black behind it, just behind the head. So if you see that, it's a grass snake and it's harmless. It is not an adder. I'm, I'm obviously coming on to adders um, so that you can tell the difference. Grass snakes um, are good swimmers. Uh, they're um, long. They're our longest reptile. And as I was explaining, they have this green, uh, greenish with a yellow and black collar. 90 to 150 centimeters long so um, usually about adults are you know about a meter long and long-lived as well so 15 to 25 years um, they live uh, and um, you can see this one swimming you can recognize them if you do see anything swimming because of course all reptiles are um, air breathing so they have to come to the surface of their aquatic to breathe and this one is just holding its head above the water. And you can see it's moving with some speed there because it's, uh, you can see the ripples. Um, and their prey is amphibians, fish, um, and they will also take small mammals um, and birds. Um, and unlike um, the last two, the common lizards, and um, I'd sorry, unlike the common lizards, they lay eggs. So um, they produce 10 to 40 eggs. Uh, in rotting vegetation, which you often find by waterways, um, but they do do very well in compost heaps as well in people's gardens. And they're quite um, widespread, although I haven't found many myself, I've had quite a few reports of them. So, for example, um, I went on a visit to Chumney Castle Gardens and I asked the gardener if they ever have any snakes and he said they have grass snakes sitting on the lily pads in the pond. So if you, I haven't seen them myself, but if you do go and you see them, do let me know. Uh, so they like to sun themselves there. Um, and I also had a lady in Tarvin who said she used to have them in her garden. Um, and I went to have a look. I, I didn't see them again. But um, the reason was that she had a massive pond and it was stuffed full of fish. So I guess it was a very good place for the uh, grass snakes, plenty of prey. And she also had a massive compost heap. And she used to get the grass snake uh, draping itself over a tree to sun itself to warm up. OK, so that takes us on to number three, which um, uh, is the slow worm. And um, these look like snakes, but in fact, they are legless lizards. And they have a very different sort of facial appearance. And you can probably make out the scales if you look closely. They're uh, much more flattened than in the grass snake. <clears throat> so a legless lizard. And um, the, the reason that you can tell that is that they can sh shed their tail like the common lizard. They have that same adaptation. Um, and also they, have, they can blink, which snakes can't. It's what makes snakes look a little bit evil, I think, because they have this staring eye, whereas I think slow worms look uh, much, much more friendly. So they're a lot smaller than the snake and they're smoother and they tend to be lovely colours. So like this um, uh, sort of golden colour that you can see in this slide and, and the slide before it's sort of a greyish colour. So they vary in colour, but um, they tend to be uh, uh, rather attractive. I know I'm biased though. Uh, okay, so um, bigger than a common lizard, um, but um, uh, much, much smaller than the grass snakes at 40 to 50 centimetres long and quite long lived, so 20, 20 years. These are the gardener's friend. They eat pests like slugs. Uh, so uh, we should definitely be encouraging them in our gardens. And they used to be very common, but um, I've only seen them once in Cheshire. Uh, uh, so they 
do seem to be doing very badly and are very rare um, in a lot of the country now. And they give birth to around eight live young, uh, so rare in Cheshire. They are doing well at Helsby allotments. So Helsby allotments, they wanted to extend the allotments and uh, they knew there were slow worms there. So they put in place very uh, good protection for them and provided them with compost heaps and log piles and um, somewhere where they could hibernate as well. And they um, are also doing quite well at um, Risley Moss, which is um, uh, a, an area which is highly protected, um, um, quite a large area near uh, Warrington. OK, um, when I started doing the survey, I got all the reports of um, where uh, reptiles had been recorded in the county of Cheshire. And this is just one of the maps, um, which I just thought I'd put in here to illustrate how poorly slow worms are doing. So these are all the recordings of slow worms in the last 10 years. Um, and I mean, the most obvious thing is that um, there's been very, very few records. Um, the green spots are in the last year, and that's only at Risley Moss, although when those records get updated, they are still doing well at um, Helsby. Uh, and um, yeah, so no sign of any in Hull, but I'm going to go and have another look at Hull allotments um, with Sue. Um, but um, I, I, I very much doubt we're going to find them there. Um, so they seem to have been wiped out over most of the county. Somebody else is surveying Baxford, so I don't know whether they're still there, but that's quite an old record, five to 10 years old. OK, so moving on to our last species, the um, adder. Um, and um, to tell you about adders, of course, everybody probably knows that they are our only venomous snake. Uh, and um, they are thought of as being terribly deadly, but um, um, in the scheme of things, you are highly unlikely to uh, be bitten by one because they're very shy um, and... <coughs> excuse me <coughs> unless you were to tread on one or pick one up then you would be very unlikely to be uh, bitten um, and um, their venom is um, um, and it's nasty you should go to a hospital but um, I've, I've read that um, there's only been 10 people who've died of a adus uh, bite in the last 100 years and of course they're extremely rare now as, as well easily recognized by the zigzag going down their back so if you think back to that grass snake it had a collar and no zigzag so if you see that um, uh, zigzag down the back that will tell you it's an adder and they're a shorter stockier uh, snake than a grass snake and they have a red eye with a vertical pupil slip whereas grass snakes have a round pupil slip uh, pupil but um, I guess you won't be staring into their eyes too closely if you can come across one. <clears throat> so, uh, so quite a lot short. If you remember that um, grass snakes are about a metre long, they're only about 60 to 80 centimetres um, and live 15 years. And they hunt lizards, small mammals and ground nesting birds. <clears throat> Give birth to up to 20 live young. Um, and very rare in Cheshire. They are definitely at Risley Moss, or, you know, as far as I know, they're, they're still there. There's um, a, um, a moss um, near Crewe called Oakhanger Moss, where uh, a lady has a farm next to it and she owns the moss and she has reported that they have adders there and she's seen them in her garden. Um, and they were recently reported at Bickerton Hill about four or five years ago, um, but they haven't been seen since. So um, I'm particularly looking for adders and slow worms because they are um, uh, to find if, if they're, they're still in Cheshire uh, very much at all. <laughs> 
Um, oh, and I meant to say, so the male is has a black zigzag down his back, so that's a male at the top, and the female has a brown zigzag. Um, and they do an amazing courtship um, dance. The males will compete with each other. That's a male and female um, mating, but um, the males will try and push each other down and they raise their heads right up um, and do uh, and test their strength against each other. And then the strongest one will mate with the female. <clears throat> Okay, so I know I said there's only four uh, reptile species in Cheshire, but I just want to mention sand lizards. Um, although there are none wild in Cheshire, uh, they are one of the UK's rarest reptiles and um, they have been bred at Chester Zoo. So they're not wild, but um, um, they uh, are, have been and are still at Chester Zoo. Um, and the zoo did a very uh, good uh, breeding program and released the uh, sand lizards at Talacra, which is um, in North Wales. Uh, and um, that um, seemed to be uh, very successful. So it seemed to be doing well there. Uh, and they're rather stunning um, lizards. So 20 centimeters long, larger than our common lizard, live around 20 years. And um, this is a male you can see in the picture in the breeding season they are very flashy with these bright green sides um, and um, if you want to see them they uh, when things get back to normal um, the wardens at Talacra do um, uh, will take you and show you where, where they are uh, so that you have a chance of seeing them and the females are brown and uh, much more camouflaged <coughs> Okay, so uh, so four species in Cheshire uh, that I'm looking for, um, and I'm doing a, a survey, so I'm following a particular uh, protocol um, to try and find where they are. So I started off by getting the records from the recording office, which is based at um, Chester Zoo called Record, <clears throat> and um, I went and had a look at all those areas to see which were suitable areas for surveying. Um, and the protocol is that you uh, get 30 mats and you put them down um, in suitable places, sort of south facing slopes, uh, if possible, next to a bit of cover. Um, and the idea is that the reptiles will um, usually hide underneath them. Um, reptiles being cold blooded need to warm up. So they need a warm place. Uh, so they need to expose themselves to the sun or be somewhere warm, um, but they don't want to be picked off by a predator like a bird of prey while they're warming up. So, um, so the idea is to do the survey, you put um, the mats out and then you walk around the area uh, slowly uh, looking for reptiles anywhere and everywhere um, and then look under the mats. And I've found one lizard under my mats so far. Um, so not massively successful, but the reason it's um, so unsuccessful is because I couldn't go out in lockdown. And the ideal time of year is March um, and April, well, late March, uh, April, May, uh, because that's when they come out of hibernation and they're slow and they have to warm up. And, and, you know, hopefully they're going to use my mats. So uh, uh, so while you're looking, you look under the mats. So I'm surveying in about half a dozen different areas. I'm using bits of roofing felt because they warm up well and they're light and they're easy to you know, carry in about half metre square. Um, and you also look in places like um, log piles. So this is the log pile at Hellsby allotments, which is um, uh, a, a good place, particularly for slow worms and lizards, because their prey will uh, live in the log pile um, and compost heaps and rotting vegetation. So uh, this is the compost heap provided for the slow worms at Hellsby allotment with very specific instructions. So uh, don't put anything sharp in and make sure you top it up and, and so on. Um, but that um, has really helped them because they're doing very well there. 
Okay, so this is some, some of the finds. So um, over on the left, you can see a common lizard. And this was at Burton Mere Wetlands, uh, the RSPB site near um, Ness Gardens. Um, and if you want to see a common lizard, if you go there when the conditions are right, so um, ideally it's sort of when it's been cool or wet and then the sun comes out, they like to sit somewhere in the sun but close to somewhere where they can rush off and, and, and hide themselves. And this picture is really interesting. I, I thought at first it was two lizards. And then when I looked closely, I realized that the lizard has a, a very different um, pattern on its tail. And it's probably because it shed its tail and regrown it. So you can see its um, tail is, um, has a different pattern. Whoops, and it's darker. Okay, and then in the middle, um, we've got a baby grass snake um, and on the right hand side. Um, and this is being held by one of the lecturers at Reese Heath College who's doing, um, uh, he manages Sound Heath, which is um, a site of special scientific interest. Um, and he has um, got 80 mats down there. You can just see one of his mats down there in the corner. He uses corrugated ones. And he's been fantastically successful because he's um, found um, and identified 30 different baby grass snakes. As the babies hide under the mats, um, babies born September, um, hatched out of the eggs around the September time. Um, and um, they're very vulnerable to predators, so they need somewhere to hide. Uh, and he's just showing the ventral surface, the undersurface on the right hand side there. And they each have uh, very different markings. So he's been able to identify them. So he photographs them and compares the photographs. And he's identified 30 individuals, which is a, a very nice piece of work. OK, um, but uh, mostly what I've found, I have to confess, is ants, which you can see at the bottom right hand side there. Uh, so ants absolutely love the mats. So it's a pity I'm not surveying for them. Uh, I don't know too much about ants. I don't know what the species are, but um, I think as a result of my survey, the numbers will be increasing. So they're, they're quite small ones. Um, and um, uh, apparently the grass snakes don't like them. So if there are ants under the mats, the grass snakes try and get away from them. They sort of cower on one side uh, because, of course, they don't eat uh, ants, unlike common lizards. Uh, at the top right, there are some uh, grass snake eggs. So that would be evidence of um, uh, grass snakes. Uh, other sorts of evidence that we might possibly find are sloughed skins, but I haven't found any yet, uh, and also droppings. But they don't have droppings which are very characteristic, so it's not possible to identify the species from them. At Chumley, I found this rather lovely pair of toads, so uh, at least the mats were being enjoyed by a vertebrate of some description. But um, unfortunately, as yet, no reptiles. OK, so I'm doing this survey and when I re, uh, find anything, I report it to uh, Cheshire Wildlife Trust and um, they can do various things to help reptiles. So um, obviously, number one is we need to identify where they are and protect those habitats and, if possible, extend them. Uh, then the area can be managed for reptiles. So reptiles need a mosaic really diverse vegetation so ideally patches of woodland um, and clear areas so woodland is good because they can hide um, adders for example will hibernate under tree roots and that sort of uh, place um, but they also need clearings because they need to come out so that they can warm up before they can become active so um, so they need open areas and they need areas which are suitable for their prey. So, for example, hummocky grassland is good for adders because um, it's the sort of place where mice and voles can um, um, hide uh, and um, um, can uh, there'll be plenty of grass and, and seeds and so on for them to eat. Whereas, of course, um, Grass snakes need water, so ponds and streams and so on. 
So um, as well as managing areas for wildlife and making sure it stays suitable for them, it's also um, it's very helpful if, if they can to connect up suitable areas with wildlife corridors. So, uh, for example, two of the areas I'm surveying are Bickerton Hill and Chumley Castle Gardens, and they're actually quite close together. So, you know, I wonder whether it'd be possible to, if I find um, uh, reptiles in both of those areas, whether um, things can be put in place to make a wildlife corridor. I haven't asked them about that yet, but um, that's a, a thought. Um, and uh, you can also add uh, ponds, compost heaps, log piles and hibernacula to uh, an area. Um, and this is the uh, picture that I've given you is of an um, hibernaculum. Um, so this is what they've provided at Hellsby allotments for the slow worms. So basically you dig um, a pit and then you fill it with um, uh, bits of uh, wood and pipes are very good and so on, um, stones to make spaces for them um, and make sure that they can get in. So there's an opening um, on the uh, side there. I've lost my face. Oh, there it is. Uh, with a snake coming out. Uh, and in winter, it means that they can go fairly deep underground and they're protected from the frost. And you just pile earth up on top. Um, and that seems to have been um, very effective, as I say, for the slow worms. Other things that can be done, you can also uh, reintroduce species. But um, um, it's been successful in some instances, so like the sand lizards um, at Talakra, but it is a very, very time consuming um, uh, exercise and it will only be effective if the habitat is right. So if you think back to what I was saying earlier on, we've lost the reptiles because we haven't got the habitat. So that's what um, uh, we need to be pushing towards. Um, studies suggest that we should have half of our land um, available for wildlife because um, um, otherwise we're just going to get this continuous downward trend. Um, so, well, it's recommended at least a third, but um, half uh, would be uh, much better. Um, and we need to return a lot of the land to make it suitable for wildlife, not just for reptiles, um, but um, as I was saying at the beginning, Birds and, um, and, um, and uh, mammals are doing very badly as well. Um, and you might have heard that um, insects are doing terribly badly. Um, and we do depend on these species. So um, it, it's important for, for that reason. So, uh, yes, yeah, so uh, one of the things we need to do to help wildlife is um, um, education as well. Um, hence the talk this morning. OK, so you might be thinking, well, um, can I do anything? What can I do? Um, so gardens are very useful. Uh, you're unlikely to find any reptiles, but even so, it's still well worth doing because many species can be helped by improving our gardens. So compost heaps, if you don't keep a compost heap, it's a very easy thing to do and I highly recommend it because um, you get um, lovely compost um, for um, your plants and it's a very quick easy way of getting rid of um, um, weeds from your garden or vegetable peelings um, and anything anything that's not cooked um, vegetation wise uh, cooked vegetables possibly might encourage rats so it's best to use um, raw stuff um, so any any vegetation though not woody stuff because that won't rot down um, and tea bags uh, turns out most of them have plastic in the outside so they're not great either uh, but um, uh, log piles are also very good so if you're trimming back a hedge if you have an unused corner maybe behind the shed or something like that if you pile up um, your wood again it's a nice easy way to get rid of um, a wood and it will rot down but as it rots, it provides um, a lovely habitat for many invertebrates 
um, which are, you know, very important in the food chain, so um, are good for many other species. Undisturbed areas are good. Ponds are great. So I found this picture, which I thought illustrated a garden which lots of wildlife would do well in. You see the pond in the middle there. Um, and avoiding pesticides if you possibly can. The other thing that you can do is um, if you're out and about, look for reptiles. And if you should happen to see them, do let us know. If you just get on the internet and find Cheshire Wildlife Trust um, then, um, and send your record in to them, then um, it just increases our knowledge about, about them. Uh, and you might find one where we didn't know that they, they were there at all. So uh, if you can possibly take a photograph, that's very useful because um, we can tell things like helps us to identify the species, but also how big it is um, and um, uh, whether it's um, uh, an adult or a juvenile and possibly even the sex. So if you know what the species is, then you could um, uh, let us know that as well. If you see more than one, how many, uh, how big they were and the location. So grid reference is great, but if not, I mean, it might be the address if it's in a garden or um, you might just uh, say, well, Little Budworth Common somewhere in the north or something like that. Type of habitat. So was it um, um, in an open area or was it in... Um, in amongst brambles or, or, or what. Um, if you think that you uh, have spotted a reptile, um, I can come and have a look. You can request a survey just by contacting Cheshire Wildlife Trust um, and we could possibly put some mats down. The mats usually go down in February and then you start the survey in uh, March. Um, so it's pretty much the wrong time of year now, except I am going to be out in September looking for juveniles in particular. Um, and um, I'm hoping they'll be easy to, uh, easier to find possibly than the adults. And if you would like to help, then you can volunteer. So a couple of members um, have been out with me um, and um, I can show you how to go about doing the survey. Um, and if you should be out and about and you spot some mats down, do feel free to have a look under them. Um, it's going to be pretty safe to do so. You're un unlikely to find any others, but um, should be done with um, uh, caution. Um, and uh, you won't discourage the reptiles from using them. You just uh, lift them up by the corner gently, look underneath and then replace them exactly where they were. <clears throat> OK, so um, I just want to finish up by talking um, a little bit about why should we care about um, reptiles. So uh, biodiversity, as I was saying, has, has decreased massively. And of course, all of our wildlife is interconnected and the loss may affect many other species. So they're part of a food chain. So um, they have uh, prey animals, which will be affected if they're lost, um, and also predators. So their predators are mainly birds of prey um, and cats. But um, so yeah, slow worms in the garden apparently get um, eaten by cats. So, but um, that's by the by. Uh, we should care because if we have animals like reptiles, they're uh, at the top of the food chain mostly um, and it means that there is plenty of prey for them and it's a sign of a healthy habitat. So uh, the fact that they're there shows that there will be many other species there. So they're important from that point of view as well. <clears throat> um, and for us as well, uh, wild places are enjoyed by uh, by many people and um, they're very, it's very good for mental health. There's been quite a few studies done recently showing that um, uh, going out into fresh air, the countryside um, and seeing wildlife um, is enjoyed by many people and can help people with depression and so on. So, um, and, and I, I just feel devastated when I go out. So in lockdown, I've been out and done a lot of uh, walking and um, 
it's just very sad how little wildlife we have left. Uh, so I think it's very important for, for us, for our well-being. Um, and it can provide employment. So we don't invest in um, our wildlife very much. So there are people like, you know, wildlife rangers and National Trust, of course, does a wonderful job and the RSPB and, and they provide um, employment for people along with helping to protect our environments. Um, and some species may have an economic uh, value, uh, not really reptiles and certainly not the ones in Cheshire. I don't want anybody to be harvesting those for economic value. Uh, but if we lose our wildlife, um, especially in plants and things, they, they can be useful for um, medicine. And often uh, people have no idea uh, what the value is. Um, and time's gone by. Uh, native people, for example, would have known much more than, than we do now. <clears throat> um, and it's part of our heritage and, and um, they are fascinating animals. I hope I've managed to convey some of the fascination uh, that I have uh, to you today. So uh, that's a baby sand lizard in the picture and it's just sitting there resting on, on somebody's hand. Um, but these are uh, intelligent, fast predators uh, uh, with uh, often that care for their young and have interesting uh, behavior. Uh, but um, uh, I feel that all wildlife should be um, protected and we need to make a, a place for all of it. <clears throat> okay, so this is um, the last slide and this is the one I'm, I'm going to send to Sue. So she's going to uh, provide it for you so that you can click on the links. And I've got some uh, fascinating films for you so that you can uh, watch a little bit more about the four species that we have, just YouTube films, and also uh, the two organisations that particularly work towards uh, the conservation of amphibians and reptiles, ARG UK and NARS, so you can get some more information from, from them. Okay, so I'll stop sharing. So um, thank you very much for uh, watching the talk and um, logging in today. And um, oh, there we are. So I can see Sue again.